Well, welcome back to number three of our series on the 144,000 of very special people. At the end of the sixth seal in Revelation 6, we find Jesus is ready to come back to earth. But there's a question, who will be able to stand? In Revelation 7, we find four angels about ready to let the winds of destruction go, but another comes swiftly from heaven, crying to those four, Hurt not the earth till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. And then it goes on to explain who these servants are. Here is the first mention of these people, this 144,000. Revelation 7, 4 to 8 explain who they are made up from. They are made up from the 12 tribes of Israel. It mentions what happens to them, that they are sealed in verse 4. However, it does not mention what they are like. To find that out, we have to go to Revelation 14, verses 1 to 5. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him a hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts and the elders, no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with woman, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. In verse 1, John sees a lamb, and he is standing on Mount Zion. So what is this Mount Zion? Well, a Bible search reveals it has multiple meanings. It, firstly, it's the stronghold of David in 2 Samuel 5 and verses 6 and 7. It is God's people in Isaiah 51 verse 16. It is God's mountain of holiness, Daniel 9, 16. It is Jerusalem, Joel 2, 32. It is the mountain of God's deliverance in Joel also in chapter 2, verse 32. It is where Jesus is crowned and will reign forever in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9 and Micah 4, verse 7. Every one of these descriptions reveals holiness. Mount Zion is a holy place. God's people are a holy people, where Jesus reigns forever will be a holy place forever. This 144,000 have their father's name written in their foreheads. They are the same group described in Revelation 7 verses 3 to 8. They have received the seal of the living God in their foreheads. And the name of of the Father in their foreheads is the same as having his Father's name written in their foreheads. Same, basically same words. So why would those who have gained the victory over the mark of the beast have the Father's name written in their foreheads? Well, in Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 15, we have these words, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and a humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. The name of God is holy. The character of God is holy. The 144,000 have the name and the character of the Father in their foreheads. They are a holy people with the spotless Lamb of God on Mount Zion. Now the forehead is the foremost or the frontal lobe of the brain. The frontal lobe is the seat of morality and judgment for the brain. God places his seal and his name where his people have made a conscious choice to unreservedly serve him. God has called us to be a holy people. He is looking for a holy people who will stand with him on Mount Zion. We read this from Inspired Word here, Testimonies for the Church. In order for us to work as Christ worked, self must be crucified. It is a painful death. 
but it is life, life to the soul. And then Isaiah 57 um, verse 15 is quoted. We have another quote here on this as well. Testimonies to ministers. There is need of contrition of soul every day, and the Lord declares the great advantage of everyone who will humble his heart and hide in Jesus. Then Isaiah 57, 15 is also quoted. So to get anywhere near the holiness of God, we need to go through the painful crucifixion of self. We must seek a contrite and humble spirit and submit to Jesus. But it will be well worth it all. It will be life to the soul. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 has these words, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. In Revelation chapter 14 verses 2 and 3, John then hears now some majestic, expansive, powerful voices of harps, most probably something he's never heard before. It was a combination of many voices singing and harpists playing harps. This is the song of the 144,000. They sing this song before the throne of God. They are overcomers, seated with Jesus on his throne. They sing the song in the presence of the four beasts and the 24 elders. The song sung describes the experience of the 144,000 in overcoming Satan in the final crisis of Earth's history, the closing scenes. You see, in Scripture, songs represent the experience of the one who is singing the song. Just two examples is David when he described his experience hiding from King Saul in Psalms 54. And Moses ex expressed joy in his victory in crossing the Red Sea in Exodus 15. Just so in Revelation 14, the 144,000 have victoriously passed through the trauma of the last days. It is they who have overcome the beast, his image and his mark of his name. It is they, the 144,000 that can sing this song. It is their experience. The song they sing is unlike any song that has ever been sung in the history of the universe. It is the song of Moses and the Lamb. It is unique to those who have gone through a similar experience as Moses and the Lamb, and the Lamb is Jesus. Our God wants us to have the same experience as Jesus. He wants us to be awake and alert at his coming. So in order to be able to sing that song, we must be like him. You know, the lives that we are living right now on this earth are creating a song. Therefore, what song are you singing? Do others enjoy the tune and the testimony you sing? You can learn the song, not only of Moses, but the song of Jesus, the Lamb, right now by beholding him and becoming changed into his likeness. You know, there are many distractions that compete for our attention. The devil will make sure of that. Don't allow the song we sing to become discordant contaminated with worldliness and tarnished with sin. But keep the notes clear and clean, ringing the arches of heaven, resounding back here on earth to everything we attempt to do. May souls see something in you that they want and need. May we learn to look to Jesus and him alone in that song that brings glory to his name. Look here, Revelation 14 and verses 4 and 5. These are they which were not defiled with woman, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in verse 5, And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. These two verses give a clearer explanation of why the 144,000 can sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. The 144,000 are not defiled with woman. 
The 144,000 have not been defiled by the wine of the harlot of Revelation 17 or of any of her daughters. Revelation chapter 12 describes a woman representing a church, a pure one. Revelation 17 describes a woman representing a church, a bad one. The harlot and her daughters in Revelation 17 defile all who partake of her wine or false teachings and false doctrines and the 144,000 have not partaken of this filth and corruption. They have escaped being sat on in her lewd and immoral position. What this terminology is saying is that God's true and pure people have not been defiled with the false teachings of the apostate churches of Catholicism or apostate Protestantism. The 144,000 are virgins, they are pure, they form a pure church, or they are part of a pure church. They come from the Revelation 12 woman who brought forth a pure son. Now, this reminds us of the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew chapter 25. The virgins have lamps, the word of God in Psalms 119 verse 105. They keep the commandments and have the spirit of prophecy, Revelation 12, 17. So from their studies, they understand the prophecies because they have the spirit of prophecy. They understand when Jesus will come and diligently prepare to meet him, not becoming distracted, but focused on their mission. With this parable, there was a whole church that was professing to be God's true members. But it is recorded that five were foolish. So what does this mean for us today? The class represented as the foolish virgins are not outright hypocrites. They have a, a regard for the truth. They have advocated the truth. They are attracted to those who believe the truth, but they have not yielded themselves to the working of the Holy Spirit or the oil. One could say they have had a head knowledge and acted that out, but it hasn't been allowed to go fully into the heart. They're not truly converted to God. Those foolish virgins proclaim God's message to others, but their own hearts have not been fully cleansed of their defects of character. Though you perhaps still get angry, upset, feel neglected if things don't go their way, self is still in control, passion overrides reason. And while telling others about the doctrines and what Christ can do for those people they preach to, they themselves lack the presence of the Holy Spirit in their own lives. And when it becomes desperate, they realize they haven't acquired the necessary oil to make it through. They go to attain that essential gift, but it's too late. The Holy Spirit is gone. Probation has closed. It's all over. But five of them were wise to fit all the characteristics of the 144,000. The wise virgins have extra oil in their vessels with their lamps. The oil represents the Holy Spirit in Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6. Thus the 144,000 are theologically pure. They are wise virgins who have filled themselves with the Holy Spirit. They have allowed him to work on their minds and on their hearts. Their purity and understanding and obeying the Bible teachings and being filled with the Holy Spirit has been a priority. Matthew 24 and verse 24, we have these words, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. There will be very many and countless distractions, but the very elect will not be deceived. It will not be possible. They are the 144,000. And the 144,000 will follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. One of the most amazing promises to the 144,000 is that they will follow, stay with, be attached to the Lamb, Jesus Christ, throughout eternity. They will follow him wherever he goes. 
And the question is why? Because they have chosen him. They have studied the character of Jesus and want to imitate him. They have prioritized Jesus and over and above everything on this earth. And they have endured persecution as no others have. Now, similar sentiments are in reference to the overcomers of Laodicea. In Revelation 3.21, we have these words, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. As also in reference to the 144,000 from the tribes of Revelation 7 verse 15, it says, Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple, and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. But there's one quote that seems to separate them from anyone else. And here is this quote here. We've touched on it before. Mount Zion was just before us, and on the mount was a building which looked to me like a temple. As we were about to enter the temple, Jesus raised his lovely eyes and said, Only the 144,000 enter this place, and we shouted, Hallelujah. Where is the throne of God? In his temple. So these two verses of Revelation 3.21 and, and chapter 7 verse 15 could well be referring to the same people. They are with him everywhere he goes. The 144,000 can sing the song of the Lamb. The 144,000 can follow the Lamb everywhere he goes throughout eternity. The 144,000 have the experience of the Lamb during the final crisis of this world. But can we achieve that goal? Can we make it? Yes, we can. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 and 22 to 24. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto the blackness and darkness and tempest. But ye are come to Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Wow. Mount Zion is the completion, the finish line of the race where we will meet our God, the judge of all humanity, and Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. At the end of earth's history, the 144,000 stand with the Lamb on Mount Zion. So if the true believers come to the finish line of Mount Zion, that's a finish, but where does it start? And in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, we see this, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author, this is where it starts, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Every one of us have a path to tread. We are all called to run that path with patience and endurance. We are to lay aside every weight, that could weigh us down, also to lay aside every sin that would hinder us in that race, also to lay aside every distraction that would divert our attention and focus on the true goal, because all these easily beset us. This is the race of faith. We are called to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He was at the very beginning of our existence and long before, and he is at the very end of our existence as well and will be forever after. Jesus helps us to begin this marathon and he promises to take us to the finish line with, with us all the way. 
And the beginning example is the sacrifice made on the cross of Calvary, but also the victory gained on that cross of Calvary. This is our hope, even as we start this race. Now, without that victory and the hope it offers, why even start to run the race? Because there is victory, there is such a hope with the invitation to follow Jesus, seeing his accomplishment, that makes it so worthy to follow and even to start the race. That empowers us to continue to run the race. Yes, it may be a marathon, but the prize is so well worth it all. And unlike any other race, everyone gets first prize who makes it to the end. He had the joy set before him, seeing the redeemed with him in heaven. Can we not foresee the joy set before us to be among the redeemed with him in eternity, even more so, being one of the 144,000? Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, is our final destination in this race of faith and endurance. And by learning to follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth, he leads us on this earth and we can follow him whithersoever he goes throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. Do we begin to comprehend this calling? Now the 144,000 are redeemed from among men. In Revelation chapter 13 verse 1 we have these words, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. In the great end-time torment and conflagration, John sees this composite beast rising up out of a very populated part of the world. He then goes on right up to verse 7, describing this Antichrist beast system. And John could see this system was going to be very influential and persuasive, to say the least. And we have Revelation 13 verse 8, and it says this, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Now John sees that all that dwell on the whole earth, not just where the beast rose up, but the whole earth give their worship and allegiance to him. So if all the world's going to worship him, is there anyone left? Well, John qualifies his statement in the rest of the verse, whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So one asks, who are those who avoid worshipping the beast? It is those who John acknowledged back in the previous chapter. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17, we see this, the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, these are the same people who are redeemed from among men, climaxing at the very end in the 144,000. When all the rest of the world wonder after this apostate beast power and go as far as receiving his mark of worship, the 144,000 who follow the Lamb instead of the beast will be redeemed from the earth. They are saved by the blood of Jesus. Beholding the Lamb of God on the cross, they follow him with faith and patience and endurance. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11, we have these words, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Lots of patience, lots of endurance, lots of faith, First fruits unto God and to the Lamb. These first fruits here in regards to the 144,000 is a conversation relating to the harvest. But as we think on the past, those triumphant people are not the first of the crop of earth to represent humanity to heaven. Jesus is described as a first fruits. In 1 Corinthians 15, 20, we have the words, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. But even Jesus was not the first resurrected. In a book, uh, An Enduring Vision by Austin Cook, on page 482, we have these words, In the Old Testament, the term first fruits referred to the best fruits of the crop, not necessarily the earliest of the fruit. And then he quotes Numbers and Ezekiel. This means then that the 144,000 are not necessarily the first to be reaped. Rather, at the second advent of Christ, they represent the best of the harvest. 
They are the best of the main crop that is very soon to be harvested. These first fruits are different to the great multitude in Revelation 7. All are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. All are saved through grace, through faith. However, the 144,000 are a demonstration of theological purity and divine character maturity not seen in a group of people from the initial fall of man until the end of the world. They endure everything thrown against them, the worst the devil can conjure up to discourage and torment them, the full wrath of the devil. But they are mature enough to hold to everything pure and godly. In a commentary, Revelation Reveals Jesus, Kenneth Matthews brings this out in his quote. It says, The 144,000 are the first fruits of the Christian era who keep all ten of the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. They answer the charge of Satan when the power of the Holy Spirit keep all of ten God's commandments and have the faith of Jesus. Are the great multitude any less saved? Absolutely not. Are those in the Old Testament who were not raised at Jesus' resurrection any less saved when they come from the grave at the second coming? Absolutely not. Satan has made accusations against the character and government of God. Jesus answers Satan by presenting the first fruits of the 144,000 at the end of time. So let's sum this up. The 144,000 represent the best of the harvest. They keep the Sabbath with all the other commandments. They have followed Jesus into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. They represent the experience that others of the saved would have gone through but didn't live at the time required to give that same demonstration of enduring faith through unprecedented trauma. All the harvest... The 144,000 and the great multitude are saved in the same way. The first fruits simply represent the best of the harvest. To the fullest extent, they have character maturity in the most difficult times of Earth's history. God will bring the rest of the harvest of the redeemed to heaven when the 144,000 demonstrate the character maturity of perfection the same as Jesus. Only Jesus can save both the 144,000 and the great multitude. Only those with the faith of Jesus are saved. The 144,000 are not co-redeemers with Christ. No, they're a demonstration of his work in them. Through his work as the Lamb of God, he will produce his demonstration. To finish up the first fruits, and speaking fairly directly here, Get to know our God with intelligent knowledge, then open your hearts to him and receive the great message of salvation. Let it work to convict and convert you to partake of his divine nature. Then let that heart conversion work out through your conduct and conversation to reach the hearts of others that what the message has done for you, it may do for them." Revelation 14 and verse 5, we have these words, And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. The closing verse of the description of the 144,000 has two additional very special characteristics. No guile. These special people have no guile or deceit in their mouths. As commandment keepers, they will not lie or have any filth in their vocabulary. This was foretold well before, even before Jesus came to this earth. In Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 13, we have these words, The remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity, nor speak lies, neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth, for they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. The true followers of Jesus were described also by Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21 to 23. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. 
Jesus had absolutely no guile in his mouth, especially in his experience as the Lamb of God, suffering the worst torture and death on the cross. This is a direct fulfillment of Isaiah 53 and verse 7. We have these words, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Christ has set before us the example that we are to follow, to follow him so closely that we will even walk in his footsteps. And you know, rather than fight back in our human capacity, may we, like Jesus, commit ourselves to our Father who judges all things righteously. The 144,000 follow this example to the letter. They are just like Jesus, perfect in character. There is no deceit or guile found in their conversations. We have here, inspired from the testimonies for the church, we have this. My brethren and sisters, how are you employing the gift of speech? Have you learned so to control a tongue that it shall ever obey the dictates of an enlightened conscience and holy affections? Is your conversation free from levity, pride, malice, deceit and impurity? Are you without guile before God? Words exert a telling power. Satan will, if possible, keep the tongue active in his service. Of ourselves we cannot control the unruly member. Divine grace is our only hope. What about without fault? Finally, the 144,000 are without fault before the throne of God. The words without fault renders out from the Greek word amomos as without blemish or blame or spot. This identical Greek word amomos is translated without spot in describing Jesus, the perfect sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14 has these words, How much more... Shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? As we have just read and studied, if Jesus can do it, we could do it. Because he is our example. It's within our reach. Jesus is the Lamb of God, without blemish, fault or spot. The 144,000 are without blemish, fault or spot before the throne of God. Yes, if he could do it, we can do it. Now look at some of these promises to verify this thought. Jude, verses 24 and 25. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Saviour, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever and ever. Amen. Here in Maranatha, we have a backup quote. But when the world makes void the law of God, what will be the effect upon the true, obedient and righteous? Will God's commandment keeping people swerve from their allegiance? Never. Not one who is abiding in Christ will fail or fall. When what will that look like? Well, here's another quote. That I may know him. If we cultivate the good, the objectionable tendencies will not gain the supremacy, and at last we shall be accounted worthy to join the family above. If we desire to be saints above, we must be saints upon earth. And what will that look like? Well, here's another one, that I may know him, page 336. We are to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ until we reach the full stature of men and women in Christ Jesus. And can I just ask, what will that look like? And another quote here, our saviour is a saviour for the perfection of the whole man. Dear friends, don't be satisfied with your compromised comfort. Please listen to what I'm saying. Wake up to your true condition and rise up out of it. Push at doors. If your motive and energy are for God, you may well be surprised at what doors will open for you. Push at the unknown with your Bible as your weapon. The 144,000 have the character that Jesus especially exemplified during his life here on this earth, even at the time of his crucifixion. 
That is why they stand with the Lamb of God, this 144,000. That's why they can stand with Jesus. It will be the moment of remarkable prophetic significance. Christ has won the great controversy over Satan. Christ demonstrated an obedient life and offered himself without blemish or fault on the cross. He produces the 144,000 who are not simply a reflection of his character. No, they are a reproduction of his character. What he demonstrated on the cross, they demonstrate through his power in the final crisis of this earth's history. The faithfulness of the 144,000 after 6,000 years of sin silences Satan's charge against God forever. The book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And here in Revelation 14 verses 1 to 5 is the revelation of Jesus Christ through the 144,000. God has taken the weakest generation that has ever lived and produced a perfect reproduction of himself. Lucifer was the highest created angel. He was a perfect angelic being in a perfect environment. And yet through the mystery of iniquity, he fell and became Satan, taking on the third of the angels with him and then led Adam and Eve into sin through his deception. However, while Satan has won many, very many battles on this great controversy, God wins the ultimate war. And when from the weakest generation that has ever lived, even after 6,000 years of degeneration, he produces an obedient people who are just like Jesus in character and who pass through the final traumatic crisis of earth's history without fault. Truly, God will have vindicated himself and his government against Satan's false accusations. The whole sin problem and the great controversy will be forever settled. And just for your personal application, as we close off, by beholding Jesus, we become like him. When we contemplate the crucifixion on the cross, we learn the great sacrifice he made for us. Then in appreciation, we learn to be like him, to take his character. The closer we come to him, the more sinful we realize we are. As we make the changes, people around us will see the difference that we're not like what we were like, but that we will have taken on the character of someone else. That is when they will come to us, when times are intensely difficult, and they'll ask, what is it that you have because I want it too? God has raised us up to be part of the 144,000. God is looking for a people who he can empower to be his demonstration to the onlooking universe. He believes in you, friends. Jesus believes in you and willing to entrust you with his character. He died for you so that you can live for him. The great climax of the great controversy is just before us. Now is the time to place our faith and our trust in him. We are weak, we are sinful, we are the weakest generation that's ever lived. But even at that stage, God's grace is sufficient for us and it will see us through. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, we have these words, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it even until the day of Jesus Christ. And I close with this magnificent quote from Great Controversy, page 678. The great controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness throughout the realms of illimitable space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things, animate and inanimate, in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy, declare that God is love. Our dearest Heavenly Father, oh, I pray that again as we've read through these words and studied them out, that we have become closer to you. And as I just pointed out in this message, the more we see Jesus, the more we realize how sinful we are and the more we need to give ourselves over. Please, God, I pray for every soul that has listened to this message, that they've been encouraged by what they've heard and that they will have a closer experience with heaven. 
Please may we all connect with heaven every morning, every day, every moment of the day. And I pray that each one of us here would, when Jesus comes, that none of us would be missing, please. Thank you for the words that we can read and study. And may they have an impact on our hearts, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.